Hello and welcome to this episode of the Sovereign Society podcast. I'm super excited about this one because I have Jeanette Schneider here with me. And what's so great is that she's passionate about so many of the same topics that I am. So I know you guys are going to love this. And uh, she just released her first book, right? Your first one, Lore. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's very interesting. There's so many like there's such a rise of books coming out right now. I think like people are really hearing the call that we need to share our story. Like we really mm. need to share our medicine. So I would love to hear what was what was the the hunch of being like, okay, now is the time for me to write this book. Now is the time for me to release this book and to share it with the world. That's such a great question because I feel like words have always been within me. Um, I've been writing since I was 13 years old. And so like I always knew I had these words and I had a way with words. Um, and I loved blogging and I loved creating story. But it wasn't until after I became the daughter to a mom. Um, I'm sorry, the mother to a daughter. That's actually how it feels. I feel like she's my mother <laughs> and my sister at all times. She's very wise. So that probably wasn't a slip up. Um, but once I had my daughter, it was, it was kind of interesting because all of a sudden I started to see the, the difference um, in my own life and in the life I wanted her to lead. And so my words started to have purpose. And mm. instead of being of these, fu these funny stories and these anecdotal kind of um, coming of age lessons, they really became a lot more focused on what we need to do as women in order to clean up our stories and our messaging so that we can raise a stronger, more powerful next generation. So I wanted to make sure that anything that was coming out of my, my, my mind, my mouth, my soul, as I was raising my daughter, was creating a new paradigm for her as she entered the workplace, as she entered relationships. I wanted it to be very mindful. So the timing was, was interesting because I always had words, but they didn't have, they didn't have focus mm. after I had her. Amazing. Yeah. What you just said literally is like my life's purpose. So I'm so passionate about helping people clean up their own mess mm -hmm. so that, you know, we can really set precedent for the generations to come. Like I'm so passionate about cultivating that conscious generation. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it now comes from us understanding like we have to take responsibility for our side of the street. And that, you know, in, in the world of shamanism, when we do the work, we can heal seven generations behind us and seven generations before us. Mm -hmm. So I know with your book, Lore, it's a lot about like folklore and like mythology. It all comes from that, the, the, the power of story, you know, and the power of us embracing our story. Mm hmm and, and healing it, right? So like, yeah. I wore such an interesting thing because it's, it's both a good and a bad thing in a lot of ways, right? Because you have these beautiful lessons that are passed down generationally through culture, through society, even through advertising, let's be honest. And some of them are really beautiful and some of them are really golden. And there are some that need to end with this generation. Mm -hmm. you know, there are some very patriarchal messages or messaging about worth and value that have come from generations of struggle or have come from really unfortunate circumstances that it's, it's time for us to pull out of us and kind of bleed out and heal so that we're not passing on those same messages of lack mm -hmm. as we're, and, and a lot of times you don't even realize, like I noticed when I started parenting my daughter as she got a little older and started listening to me and you know being able to reason more like you immediately parrot what's been told to you so if your child asks you something or even in relationships you say what you've heard that you've just kept within your fiber right you conditioning say, yes and mm -hmm. you just say it so mm -hmm. i learned how to take like a pause and be like okay is this mine or is this something that i believed because my family believed it for a very long time mm -hmm. and i think I, th I feel like the book came out now because like there hasn't been a better time in human history where people are really embracing themselves and they're really saying like, well, this doesn't resonate with me anymore. And right. so we have to make peace with that past, you know, and just be like, okay, well, it brought me here. I, 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 I thank it. I bless it and like continue to move forward. Yeah, no, absolutely. I had a couple of friends um, recently who shared with me that they had to really kind of understand how they felt about social. Um, and one of my friend's daughters, her best friend is came out as being a lesbian at 14 years old. And she's like, 
I don't know how to deal with this because I've been taught from a religious perspective, this is bad, but this doesn't feel bad. This is a little girl who I love her and she's my daughter's best mm. friend. And I actually had to sit back and say, okay, let me pull out all the stuff that I heard from Bible class and my parents and religion. When I have this human being that I adore in front of me that I've known since she was in diapers and I just want to love her. And it was just really interesting to me because people are a lot more who they are now. So we're finding a lot more older, probably Gen Xers, baby boomers are kind of like, okay, well, do I actually believe the things that are coming out of my mouth when people are becoming a lot more um, aware and embracing who they truly are instead of keeping it quiet or under wraps? Yeah. And the generations really before, because I feel like these kids, like the kids now are post 2012. The kids now are like from a new millennia. So yeah the way that their like DNA and everything is so different than what ours was, you know, and we're like the, the bridge between the two millennia, you know, our generations. And so it's, it's very fascinating to see the kids today, like really tuned in and hone in, like honed into the truth of like, this is who I am. When I feel yeah. like, what a beautiful opportunity for us to go back to our childhood and heal and transmute those limits. Like you said, the limiting beliefs. And I think it's a lot of like people that are like, you know, not children. Like there's a lot of uh, diving back into really, like you said, what resonates with me, what doesn't, like what is true to me. And I think that right there, like doing that work is going to really be paving a really powerful road. Mm -hmm. for the futures ahead. I do feel like that's part of like, that's part of the work that's happening right now because it's not going to, it's, it can't be like that anymore with the way that society is really evolving. Yes, absolutely. I had to give a talk to a group of Girl Scouts recently and even, so even societally, even family, you know, familial bonds are changing. But um, I was talking to these little girls and we were at a STEAM conference and I said, you are so powerful. And one of the little girls raised her hands and she's like, how am I powerful if I still have to do my homework? And I <laughs> thought it was adorable. But one of the things I shared with her is I'm like, you don't understand. Not only are your parents trying to understand how best you learn, but companies are studying you. Um, higher ed are studying you because you have changed the dynamic of the way we do business and enter industry and the way we look at charity, the way we look at home ownership, the way we look at finances, the way we look at the world in general. So your generation is being studied because you're so different. You're the first generation without, you know, that's never known a world without technology. I say that all the time. They're, the way they look at the world is very different. And there was actually a young girl who um, was on a panel recently she's gen z and she was telling me you know i'm so offended when people give us such a hard time about the fact that we're so connected because they don't also realize that we're not 18 yet but i know everything about systems of power and other governments and what's going on in political situations and who's hungry and famine i can't vote but i already have opinions on world situations that you didn't know anything about when you were my age i was like damn girl, drop some knowledge, you know, like yeah. she is so powerful. And I was like, your generation is going to do some serious stuff. Yeah. It's, it's really beautiful. interesting. You say that. Cause last night I was at Marianne Williamson's presidential announcement. Mm -hmm. So I was supporting the live stream team and holding the container and, you know, supporting, um, that. And it's very fascinating to see that, you know, and to see how everything is shifting to bring more even of that feminine essence of nurturing, you know, and I think a lot of times, like I know for me growing up, like as a little girl, like I went to Catholic school and there was like the proportion of, of boys to girls in the class, like there was only like 10 girls and like 30 boys, you know? Mm -hmm. So that in itself was just like, you know, it was, it was really challenging to be like embrace, like being a girl and like not being able to have <clears throat> you know, my, my, I don't know. I didn't really resonate with a lot of the girls in my class. So it's really interesting to see like more and more girls, like even breaking the mold of like what a girl is supposed to be right. in today's world. You know, I think I'm, it's been kind of evolving. Um, <clears throat> I'm clearing my throat chakra as I say that. 
um, it's really evolving in that sense. And you're seeing like more of these programs of like little girls, like with scientists and, you know, technology and coding and all of these things that I think that like watching Marianne on that stage, you know, like that would have not been a thing talking about spirituality too. And talking about how things would be cleaned up. That wouldn't have even been a thing a couple years ago, yeah. you know? So now I feel like, there is this massive wave that is happening of like girls and women really feeling empowered to do whatever it is they want. So I would love to know like you working with, you, you mentioned a little bit, you working with these groups. I know you have your daughter and stuff. Mm -hmm. She's very active and Girl Scouts, like you just said, I would love to hear what you personally are seeing. Uh, with this wave of girls like breaking stereotypes of what it is to be a girl? I think it's really fascinating because I have moments of your, like, pure joy where I see these girls who are so empowered and I do support specifically the local Girl Scouts in my area. And so I get to see them at their STEAM conferences and doing their projects and they have no expectation that things could be any different, right? And I think that that's amazing and beautiful. What concerns me more than anything is that these are girls who've been put in a situation where they can see women that they can aspire to become. Not all girls have that same opportunity or are there yet. And I was just interviewing um, Dominique Goncalves. So she's the, um, cons uh, the elephant conservationist at the Mozambique National Park called Gorongosa. And she specifically came from Mozambique and got involved in ecology and conservation but her passion is helping the girls in her area because there's child marriage there. Mm. And so she's like, I want to end child marriage. And then she was talking about the difference in between the boys and the girls and how if there's opportunities for education, they're given to the boys. And that when she goes and she talks to the girls, they have no expectation that they can be anything more than mothers and caregivers and nurturers and to tend to crops and things like that. So she gives them she sits down and she goes, it's great when they're singing and they're excited to see me. And she's like, and then I have to end that. And I have to get real. And I have to show them pictures of me getting my master's degree and working with elephants and tracking them across the park because they need to not see me as someone that lived in the village. They need to see me as an accomplished woman. They can't be what they can't see. So I think for me, I get to see the dichotomy. I get to see these really impassioned, impactful um, women kind of put themselves out there. And if anyone's listening, I, I say, if be an example to the girls in your life, you don't know who's looking at you. There's nothing wrong with the fact that most little girls, the first thing they say they want to be when they're little girls is I want to be a mother or a teacher. It's wonderful. It's who they first see. It's who's first in their presence. So it's the only thing that they can imagine. Mm -hmm. But you put them in front of an elephant conservationist or a political figure or something like that. So I think more than anything, what I'm seeing is we need more opportunities for girls to see what they can aspire to. And it's needed. Like there's all kinds of data that comes out of Harvard and Kinsey that says we need more girls in positions of power mm -hmm. in STEM-based fields because there's actually data that shows the more women in positions of power, decision-making roles and on boards, the healthier companies are. So we actually support the global economy and the community at large. So if you arm these little girls, which is like my life's purpose, <laughs> with the ability to, to take on these roles and these positions of power, they're going to have the opportunity to pull their communities, their villages, their tribes, their families out of poverty, socioeconomic issues, early pregnancy, teen violence, they have such um, great opportunities at their fingertips. We just have to give, we have to put more women in front of them and I think empower more women to kind of lead the way. Um, mentorship is a beautiful thing. Yes. And I think it's more, especially in the States, of course, in, in developing countries because they don't get that enough. But in the States, especially too, because so many of our public schools today don't, aren't even like up to code. Yeah. with with school supplies, working toilets, things like that, especially in these more um, impoverished areas, you know, where taxes aren't really supported to schools and things like that. I think 
it's like the big brother, big sister kind of initiatives of the mentorship. And I know, mm-hmm. I think it's really, I think it's so critical and to, cause like the children are truly the future. And mm-hmm. so it takes us as adults to also, like I said, take responsibility for our side of the street, clean up our mess. Mm-hmm. And to, if you want to master something, like how do we teach? We have to be able to teach, you know, through our own experience and share like, I think that's a lot of the things of like not shaming where you've come from because yeah. there's someone, there's a little girl out there that just feels so alone and feels like no one understands what she's going through. And there's such sponges, especially between the ages of zero and eight, like when the subconscious mind is being formed, like that right there, I'm so passionate about. And in my work, I do so much child, like inner child healing, you know, mm-hmm. and really going back to those years of zero to eight and seeing where those core wounds of like abandonment and betrayal and that gets stuck in our DNA, that gets stuck in our cells. And when we have children, guess what? They're still going to have to go through it if we don't to go through it. So I would love to hear what you're, you're feeling about the power of the subconscious. And I know like in lore, you have it as past, present, future of doing the work. So really going in and making peace with that past of really cleaning up our childhood. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's, you can't, for my daughter, I had to do it for myself and for my daughter, right? I had, mm-hmm. had to like dig in and be like, first. exactly. I'm like, what is it? And, and why am I entering certain relationships and why am I allowing certain things in my life? And I think they say that a girl's self-esteem peaks at eight years old. And what I think is fascinating is most of the, through the process of lore, it was actually kind of an accidental project um, where I had all of these really amazing, successful career women who I interviewed and said, would you share things that you wish you would have known when you were girls? And then we started doing love letters to our younger selves. The majority of the love letters to younger selves are between the ages of four and seven years old. That just for some reason, it's, we keep coming back to those age ranges from the letter um, from the writers. And it's, it's things about amb- abandonment, worth, lovability. Um, there is some trauma, absolutely, in some of the letters that I received from some of the women. And what's amazing is once you find these truths out about yourself, that your subconscious, um, it's almost like a, a story that you have carried with you throughout your entire life and it has colored every single situation, every single relationship, every single work environment. And once you actually see that and you actually get this negative truth that comes straight out of your soul, you can't turn away. You have to do the work. So I start with basically asking people to do visualization and really start to see that younger version of themselves. And through the questions that I ask, you usually start to like really get clear on this younger version of yourself and then kind of ask, what do you need from me? And that's when it's like, oh, I mean, the power that comes from it is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. The first thing that came to me when I did the process was you'll spend the majority of your life believing you are unlovable. And that just, I had no idea that I had this deep seated belief system that I was completely unworthy and unlovable. And I had continued to enter abusive relationships, bad choice in friendships. I was showing up in the office office, even showing that I was not worthy to be there, just kind of like with everything, and just like, give me what you will. And I spent quite a bit of time reparenting that version of myself who through story and through issues within my own family, believed this thing that was untrue. And it's completely reframed the way I look at, at the world relationships. I cleaned up a lot of relationships. I ended some friendships. I am now in the most mindful and purposeful relationship I've ever been in. And I think one of the like crowning achievements in all of this was that I come from a series of abuse. All of the women in my family have been beaten, abused, and raped. And I ended a cycle, and I knew it on the day that my daughter and I were talking about our superpowers. And I said, well, what's your superpower? She said, if I was a superhero, my name would be Love Alive. Her name's Olivia. She's like, and my superpower is that I'm so lovable that I have all this love to give people. And I was just like, cycle ended. I did it. Like I was so <laughs> proud because she doesn't have this belief. Yeah. She knows that she's lovable. She knows that she's just like this perfect little being. And that was conscious. That was conscientious parenting and conscious mindset because I wasn't transferring old 
wounds to the next generation, but it's, it's deep work. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting because I was having, it was interesting because I read a report that last year was the lowest birth rates that we've had in like decades. Mm -hmm. And I think a little bit has to do with like the world that we're facing right now. But I, a part of me also feels like a lot of people are really taking responsibility. Like, I think people have been really on like conscious. There's been a massive wave of consciousness of waking up and a lot of us are really saying like, I don't want those things to be carried on to my kids. Like there's, there's been, I feel like this is like our generation is really like the last generations to really have to do that, you know, as in terms of the majority, because there are more people that are like waking up to consciousness and there is like the world is becoming more supportive of that consciousness of like, okay, like, I want to clean up this mess, you know, like, I think we really understand the vast majority of us really understand that like, we, we don't have to be suffering anymore. And we don't have to see that with our kids. I mean, there's definitely still a massive population of people. Like I said, again, in, um, in impoverished areas where there's so much stress and they're, they don't have as much of the privilege, you know, or they think they don't of really doing the work or healing and, and being able to to clean up the mess. But I do believe that more conversations like the ones that you and I are having are giving people permission to really go there. Because I think just a lot of people are really afraid of what they're going to find. But finding those support groups or like listening to podcasts of hearing other people's stories of like, it's possible. I think that's been a huge driving force for people to be like, I'm done playing small. Like I'm over my own bullshit. Like, I really am wanting to make change and I know that it starts with me. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. I think I think there's fear moving into like self-work and self-development and any type of spiritual journey that you go onto, right? Because you're worried at first in a lot of ways about how your family or how your peer group is going to accept you. Mm -hmm. But I'm finding more people are kind of bucking the system and and starting to question whether or not the things that they've been told, you know, and it used to be that like, that was what you did. You got married, you had a job, you have a pension, you have children, you procreate, like that's just the way things are. And I think we now have a culture of people are kind of poking at that and saying that that's not life happiness for me. My life happiness does not resolve around whether or not I can procreate or I have a pension plan or the American dream of home ownership. Mm -hmm. Those things were stories that were told because, you know, our great grandparents went through the great depression and there was this story of lack and you have to grab what you can and you have to have children because of some religious belief systems. And I love that now that's all kind of in question. Um, I kind of smiled when I heard about the birth rates actually kind of going down. Cause I'm like, well, people are starting to realize like, that's not, that's not, not all that you have. That's not all that you can offer the right. world. And the wave fashion. of women who say they don't want kids. Yeah. Well, and there's so many women who've had children in the past who didn't want children, but mm -hmm. they felt they had to because of their own you know, societal belief systems. Um, I, I do feel for women, I will say, I, my daughter was a product of fertility treatments. I could not get pregnant without. And so I, I do recognize that with advanced age, if you decide that you want to have a child, like I wouldn't wish that upon anyone because mm -hmm. that was a very difficult road for me. Um, but I, I did tell my daughter the other day, she announced that she's getting married to her best friend, a little girl at 18. They're actually having their pre-wedding ceremony this coming weekend. And um, she was like, but we're not having kids. And I was like, that's great. But when you have your real wedding, I would like for you to have like already kind of decided what you want to do in life. And she's like, I'll agree to that. So it's just kind of, it's just kind of funny. I love, I love the world through the, the lens of a little person. Yeah. And I, especially a little person in the world today, mm -hmm. like it's such a wild time to just see what's happening. And like you said earlier, they're so aware of what's happening like there are no dummies. Even, like I, it's fascinating, like seeing young kids even today, like young adults. You know, like I have a a twenty year old cousin who's like so passionate about politics and all these things, and like that was even like not common. You know, like a couple like a decade ago. You know, right. especially even in my generation, like there's people in my world now that are like, oh, I'm spiritual, so I don't get involved in 
in the politics or things like that. But these kids today, they're like you said, they're understanding like, hey, I'm going to be me. And hey, there's things that need to be like addressed in the world. It blows my mind just being an observer of these kids today where it definitely feels like they're carefree. And there's some girls like this one girl that's like, she's like my little mentor. And sometimes she listens to my podcast. She's like in middle school. I love it. Yeah. And she's, uh, she's a good family friend's daughter and she just loves me now. She's like into crystals and like, you know, and she was like, the world ended in 2012. And I was like, tell me about that. And she's like, yeah, the world ended in 2012. And now like we're living in a new world and we're just cleaning up the mess of the old world. I just got goosebumps. <laughs> I know. <laughs> what? I know. Oh, I love it. No, my daughter. Grader. So yeah. my daughter, what I mentioned about her when I said she's my, my mom, when she was about three years old, four years old, she says, mom, back when I was your mom and you were my daughter. And I was like, what? So it's just kind of, it's just kind of funny. They're so, they're so wise. They're and the crystal pure. kids. They're so, yeah. they came here. Cause like they're, I think they're here to like help support us. Cause like we've been, there's so much of ourselves that have had like really gnarly past lives and like really gnarly like ancestral clearing of like coming from the immigrant family and having to go through that scarcity mindset and like you know all of that the tough stuff and then these new waves of kids are like these crystal kids that are like helping us see the reflection of what is possible yeah well, and I remember when my daughter, when she first went into preschool, I truly appreciated because she has several friends who have, um, their parents are same sex. Uh -huh. And so she's never known anything to be different because as far as she knows, her friends' dads could always get married and her friends' moms could always get married. And someone referred to, you know, color one day and she says, mommy, we're, we're not colors. We're all this shade of, of, you know, skin tones or something like that. And I loved it. And I, I do recognize that there has to be. I want to cry. Well, I think it's so <sighs> beautiful and so pure. And I wish we could get to that place. And there, I've had people argue with me like, well, they need to understand culturally what some people have gone through. And I'm like, absolutely, absolutely. But we don't need to put our lens on it, right? Let's share the history of, of the way things have been, but the positivity of where we are in certain situations, right? Yeah. And it's one of the things I truly appreciate about her is that she sees things so in such a pure kind of fashion and I've done everything I can not to, to mar that in any way and to make sure that, you know, we talk a lot about like, what's, how does your heart feel? Do you feel anything in your tummy? And like, she asked me one day um, about abortion actually. And um, there was a sign at her school. Um, she was gone to Catholic school and there was a sign about the sin of abortion and she had read it at five years old. And I was like, I don't know how to have this conversation with this child. And so what I asked her instead was, well, how does it feel in your heart? And she said, well, this is how my heart feels. And I'm like, then that's your belief. Catholicism is a religion. This one is a religion. That one is a religion. They all lead to God and God wants you to feel what's in your heart. And she was like, okay. And I was like, Oh, you know, like I, I don't that want was good, mom. Yeah. No, I was thinking, yeah. like, but I was also thinking through my heart, right? Like it was, what did I want from my mom when I was at that age? I didn't want to be, I didn't want rhetoric vomited at me, which unfortunately like, I was raised in a very high control religion where I was just spoon fed, um, beliefs that were not my own. And so I truly believe that she needs to be raised with the ability to form her own. So mm -hmm. um, I give her the options and tell her, well, this religion believes this and this religion believes that, but you need to find what feels what right resonate. in your heart. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a lot of that from my, if I think of my childhood growing up in Catholic school and my aunts, like a minister, pastor, like I, that's been a huge part. I think like what's really strong right now is the, is the breaking of that like construct of like having to be in a like this container of like this is what you need to be and i think the kids today are so in tune with that you know and they're yeah. very they're they they really have the confidence to really make their own decisions and to really uh be like no this is like they're very like blunt about like no <laughs> It's like they know boundaries of like, no, that's not your projection on me. 
Well, and I love that too, because I write about boundaries specifically, right? Like I love that my daughter and a lot of the kids I see are being given permission to create boundaries that we didn't have permission to create when we were children. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us are reparenting ourselves and learning how to create boundaries in adult relationships because we didn't have that ability. We were told, be quiet. Children are only allowed to speak when spoken to. You know, there was this almost, if you had an opinion, you were being disrespectful. Mm -hmm. Where my daughter is like, you're allowed to have an opinion as long as you're respectful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she, we have had down conversations where she's like, mommy, I don't like it. Like when we're at home and you tease me and you're like, you're being crazy right now. I don't mind that. But when we do that in front of my friends, I don't care for that. And I'm like, thank you for telling me your boundary. Um, because I want to know that as she gets older and she enters a relationship, she can look at her first boyfriend and be like, don't do that. Like that's, to me is, you know, that's success if they understand how to share that. And from what I'm seeing, a lot more parents are kind of getting on board, understanding the kids. We don't need to look at um, their disagreement or argument or questioning as them questioning our parenting or questioning us as an adult or being disrespectful. There's a fine line, I think, between whether or not they're being disrespectful and whether or not they're just curious and trying to establish their own boundary system. So, I mean, and each parent knows your kid. So, you know, when, it, when that's happening, right? Yeah. Cause I, I think like, I know for me, the biggest topic has been the boundaries. You know, I was with one of my girlfriends last night and she was talking about like boundaries have been such the hot topic because we weren't really taught boundaries. And, nope. and especially as women, I feel like we have a natural hunch to be that people pleaser and like, Put, taking care of everyone else first, but that's very, it goes back. Like that yeah. is like very, very strong of the lineage, you know, like we saw our mothers and our grandmothers like taking care of everyone else. And I think with, again, with this new wave, it's like the boundaries of like, if you're going to serve or you're going to take care of someone else, you have to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And so learning to say no and to see more of these kids really saying no. And I just like, I love seeing my friends that have children already, like allowing their kids to be like individuals mm -hmm. and like really sharing what they want and like honoring that space for them. Because I, I think like that's when you talk about like, oh, she, your daughter says she's lovable. Well, we really start to see our kids have the boundaries. Like that to me is like really seeing like, okay, like the work has been like, clear yeah. and i and we've, we that's why i'm so passionate about like sacred disruptors because we are disrupting patterns mm, that absolutely. aren't susceptible and aren't sustainable for the futures to come so it's very fascinating to see more of these children this is like really and like with conviction they say mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. Like girls in the schoolyard are saying no to the boys and boys also, cause I don't want to just, I want to also make sure we're talking about little boys because it's important that they also, you know, there's so much of the women's movement that they're seeing and they have to also know like that's part of a toxic masculinity too. If we don't allow boys to also like, I don't say boys will be boys, but boys to express their emotions and boys to express what they're feeling. Yeah. And I think, I think boys do get kind of lost in the shuffle and I feel bad for mothers of boys right now because I don't want boys to be raised in this environment thinking that there's something wrong with them because of this like girl power kind of thing going right. on. I think what we need to do for boys more than anything is give it, give them the words, um, to express their emotions and, um, that's the one thing that I think that we lack. I, I remember talking to someone that, um, worked in marketing for the American girl, um, company. And they were saying that they have a book about emotions, an American girl. And there were several boys companies that were asking if they could actually license that because there's nothing to talk to boys about emotions and what they look like. And I think there definitely is, I, I never want to leave boys behind because I think they're just as important as, as, as important as girls. And even in my feminism, I even shared that I will never say, girls roll, boys droll, or girls are better than boys. We're just different than boys. And unfortunately, because of my own situations, experience within toxic masculinity, the workplace, and some, you know, unfortunate 
circumstances. I feel very strongly and I advocate very loudly, but I also am the first person to say, but don't forget that we are not better. We just need each other. Mm -hmm. so if we can find a way to bring that masculinity and the, the femininity together as mm -hmm. decision makers together, respect together, mm -hmm. I think that's where things are going to change. Right. Because now like even girls can join Boy Scouts mm -hmm. and things like that, which is great because there's a lot of thing in Boy Scouts that of those survival skills of like being out there that I think it's great that women and girls are girls are really interested in that. But I also know that like there is a rise of like men's like boys groups like my mm -hmm. friends in in um, in Washington he has a, a a company like he has this group that he calls Journeymen and I went to college with with the with the two men that are running it and they're very passionate about helping men really like boys become men in a way of like expressing emotion and like. Beautiful. what that means to have like true like brotherhood and because there is uh, it's been really challenging for me to see that because like I'm a, I'm a sociologist at heart and I and I love seeing the rise of, of women leadership of course but there is still that huge like hello like we also need to really make sure that these boys don't feel abandoned or they don't feel disempowered you mm -hmm. know and I think it's so critical to really bring more of that awareness or still to have those conversations um, to be able to support boys uh, because, you know, they are, they too are the future. <laughs> it's like yep. not just little girls. It's like these boys are also the future. Yeah. No, I a hundred percent agree with you. And I wish that there was the perfect answer. And I think that's the thing that I'm struggling with right now. I just got back from Africa. I was there for two weeks and I was so entrenched in patriarchal systems of power while I was there. And even within safari, right. And watching everything that's happening on the Serengeti plains with the animals and the, I actually had, there's two gentlemen that were there from LA and they were like, have you noticed how patriarchal even the, the plains are when you're looking at the animal kingdom? And I was like, yeah, it's, it's, it's baked in. Right. And then we went to some of these, I, I truly believe that there has been, kind of a movement away from rites of passage, right? Where boys go through something to kind of show honor and loyalty to become a man, but then I'm with the tribe that they do have rites of passage, but even the local villagers are like, but they treat their women poorly. Mm -hmm. And so I'm struggling, right? Because I'm like, I know, I know from a a data scientific perspective why we need girls in positions of power and how toxic masculinity has damaged them. But we've failed our boys too. Like there's, there's something that has been broken. And I don't know that we're ever going to get to an environment where we're genderless, right? Where we're mm -hmm. like, I see the value of the man and I see the value of the woman and we need both to come together. Right now, what we're trying to do is we're trying to correct a broken system by raising up the other side, but it's still creating. I mean, you've got to create, to, to fix that broken system, you had to create a new system. Exactly. And I think yeah. that that's what's frustrating me right now too, is because with the Me Too movement, beautiful. We need more women to come forward and talk about the abuses that have happened within the workplace. I myself have, I can say Me Too way too many times. The thing that bothers me now about that is we're moving straight from issues of sexual harassment to gender discrimination because now men in power are afraid to be around women. And I'm like, what are we doing? So it's, it's almost like- we've It's like the pendulum swinging right now. And then there has to come a point where it finds itself in the center right now because it's just like there's so much hurt that's arising right now. And so yes. I think that's why that pendulum is, is swinging is because there's such pain. There is. And, and it's generational totally. on both sides, on both sides, right? Because you've got so many different systems of survival and scarcity that have been baked in to both genders. Um, throughout the span of time. So it's, it's one of those questions that's really hard to answer. Like people are like, what would you do in this situation? And I'm like, I think we need to like throw it all away mm -hmm. and start over. But that's, you know, that's, that's one of those wish, you know, wishful kind of things. Like how do you start from a place where I think it's still education. I think it's having conversations. I think it's education. I feel like it's allowing like an open forum for like men and boys to feel safe to talk. Mm -hmm. 
like really creating that container because then they, it's like kind of like going back into the womb for them, right? Yeah. Like that sacred container for them to express what they're feeling and to continue to educate and encourage boys to share their emotions, you know, but and, until dad really works through that too, it's going to be really challenging for, for a boy to, cause you know, they look up to their fathers or even if they don't have a father's, you know, I think, I think boys who are raised by their mothers are a lot more, um, they can be a lot more like empathetic growing up and seeing like if they had like women or sisters, you know, mm -hmm. seeing in that space. But then there's boys that don't have their fathers. A lot of them, you know, especially people like boys of color were mm -hmm. a lot, there's a higher percentage of their, them being fatherless because their fathers are in jail for nonviolent crimes or, um, you know, other things that kind of have been either generational or part of this, of the problem of the system of, of race. And so it's, to me, it's going to be really interesting to see. And I think, like I said, I think with boys, it's like the mentorship and like allowing them, because I feel like they're yearning for that. They really are, but they just don't know how to express it as well as little girls because they're afraid to. But then again, this new wave is just, it's very different too with this, this new wave of kids. Yeah. I, I just, I know that I feel hopeful, I think is the only mm -hmm. thing that I Me would too. say, because I see so many people stepping up, young people um, stepping up. I see data and statistics and shifts in, in political dynamics and who wants to step up and who wants to be involved. And so I'm like, I'm just, I will be here and be an advocate and I will do what I can and I will do my part and I will raise a good human being. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, at some point in time, I mean, I'm curious to see what happens in the next five years within the United States, because I think that there's a lot of conversations that are bubbling at the surface mm -hmm. um, that are all very important. Um, but I had a friend tell me one time, he was very wise. I was stressed out about the political climate and what was happening with the recession in 2008, 2009. And we sat down and I'm like, what are we going to do? And he goes, Jeanette, people have been asking that question over the span of, of lifetimes. We always think that what's happening with like in our situation has never happened before and is the biggest, ugliest thing. And we always continue to progress and we always continue to move forward and we always continue. He's like, just continue. And I was like, mm -hmm. that's, and that's the inner creates the outer in that yeah. way too. It's like, if you allow yourself to progress and you allow yourself to invest in yourself, your time, your money, your energy to becoming a better human being, guess what? You're going to see that in the world too, because the inner creates the outer. Yeah. And there's a ripple effect. And when I wrote my book, I said, if it helps one woman change her messaging, that will mean the world to me because I know there's a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. It will affect the people that are around her that she loves. It will affect her children and their generations. Mm -hmm. If I can be a ripple, if I can help with a ripple of one woman, I'm down. And you know that it's been such a blessing to see how many people the book has resonated with. Right. Because I'm like, I, I can see shifts happening for people that are going to last well beyond our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Um, as long as they continue to commit to do the work. Yeah, because I think a lot of people have to really understand that the, the past, the present, and the future are all interconnected, mm -hmm. you know, and what we do now is going to affect our future, plain and simple. And what happened, everything up to this sentence right here was everything the past brought up mm -hmm. to this moment, you know, like now the last sentence behind is the past. Like, it, they're so interconnected and people like they either are so pigeonholed of like stuck in that trauma of the past or they're just so like future tripping or like to be, but to be able to take that action now and to take the time to sit down to do like the exercises you have in the book to really like choose. It's the decision yes. that they're ready <laughs> to like see things differently, you know, and it's the words can be great, and we can read all that we want, but it's the experience that really implements that change. That's such a, a true statement. And I think one of the things that I've shared with people more than anything, because a lot of people start my, my book and they are like, whoa, like this is a lot because, and it's not because I'm, I'm trying to preach anything. It's simply questions that are pulling out stories and belief systems and old patterns. And sometimes when you're confronted with the ugliness, 
it's easy to kind of go hide. And my advice has been like, if it's, if you don't know me, so if my words have affected you, it's because it's for you. There's something there that you need to bump up against, get to the other side of it, but Mm -hmm. it's a choice. It's absolutely a hundred percent a choice. And you have to shift your, your orientation from a passive victim blame. This has happened to me and learn how to choose every day the new life, the new verbiage, the new relationships, the new way of being um, in order for it to really take effect. And the other side is so blissful. And that's the one thing that I've shared is I would never want to live any other way now that I know the difference. And there's also a huge amount of self-awareness. Like you have to get to the point to recognize when you're being a victim and to recognize when you're using blame or when an old pattern has popped up. And I will give you an example. My relationship, we had our first real fight while we were in Africa. We've been together for a year. And other things were like little, small, not fights at all. This one was an actual fight. And we got through it very quickly and even said, I responded to you the way I responded in the past. I use my old ways and my old tools of dealing with this situation. And so even recognizing that in the moment when you're fighting with someone and saying, I just reverted to my past and the way I used to fight with people. And I'm not going to do that with you. And I'm sorry. I recognize that's that. That's huge. It, right. But that's a lot of self-awareness. That's mm-hmm. a lot of self-awareness. And what's interesting, what I was hearing when you were saying that is like, people who like are on the spiritual path or the personal development path, like they can think in the beginning, like, Oh, if I do this, then like I'm clear forever. Right. You're <laughs> human. Like you're still going to have these issues. The difference is the, the, how back you can come back, come back time of yeah. like, are you going to stay down in that spiral or are you going to be able to shift that at a rapid rate? And that's what the work does. It's like those things can still arise but you have that self-awareness of like, okay, this is arising. I don't need to be stuck in this for like weeks and days. It's like, let me like drop everything. Like, let me address this. Let me get real, get honest and heal it clear and transmute it now. That's funny. I time myself. I actually time myself. I love that. (laughs) Because I'll be like, something will pop up and I'm like, ooh, this doesn't feel good. I don't like it. And It'll take me like a minute. And there was like a couple of things that I was, I have an executive coach and I was telling him about it. I'm like, I, cause I have learned that in my pattern, um, when I'm upset about something, my first thing is to either become a martyr or to close down. And I have gotten to the point where I'm like, Oh, there's the martyr. Like I turned it from, turned it around within 45 minutes today. Today I was able to recognize the pattern within 30 minutes and turn it around. Incredible. yeah, like I've gotten to the point where I time myself because I'm like, how quickly can I recognize that I've just moved into martyrdom or I've started to close down as a passive aggressive way of dealing with something? Whoo, yeah. And because I think that's 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 the key right there. Like that's the golden ticket right there. Is just the shit will still arise because those challenges come up to continue to allow us to evolve to get stronger and to continue to have a deeper sense of compassion when you meet someone else down the line. So I think that, that like, I love the idea of timing that that's so great. Well, and it's funny too, because like, you know, within spiritual work and I've written this book and I have like my Instagram, it's like all of the flowery words that are so important to me and the things that I say that I want to help. Like I want to reach hearts, but I also have a shadow side, right? So there are, there are people that, you know, they don't want to see the shadow side of themselves. And the one thing I would say to them is befriend the shadow side of this. Mm-hmm. The fact that I can tell you, I don't, we've just met today and I'm like, Hey, when I'm triggered, I become a martyr or I get passive aggressive. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty like, that's pretty big. And I think one of the things I would want to share with people is like, be comfortable finding your shadow side, because as much as you can be on this beautiful path, that doesn't mean that you're not going to have ugly characteristics that show themselves, but you have to actually be able to put words to them um, and, and kind of see them when they, when they arise. So don't be afraid of the ugly parts of yourself. Yeah. And I think that that's so important is like embracing the shadows because that's like, I always say the stars shine brightest in the darkest of nights. Mm -hmm. And I love when the shadow arises because I know I'm up leveling. Oh, that's good. (laughs) 
all right I like that you know what I mean like yeah. that just came to me like I love when the shadow arises because I know I'm up leveling to a higher thing because that shadow has been taking space mm. and for me to up level to this next level I have to clean house so that I can have that a more solid and healthier container for the next evolution of like my soul, my journey to, to be embodied. Mm -hmm. you know? So I think I want people to understand that like, there's no shame of the shadow, like right. the spiritual bypassing, like that is such a huge topic that I talk about because it's like so many people are like, Oh, you have to love and light, but like you have to love and light those shadows too, you know? And it's like, right. you have to understand. Cause again, like, it cannot be ours. It can be ancestral. It can be societal. Like it can be, it can be ours. Uh, but I think the days of like shaming and blaming really are coming to an end. Yeah, no, I agree. And it's funny because I actually, I give my, my daughter words so that when she's in other situations, she'll even say, we don't blame in this house. I heard you just use blame. <laughs> so like, it's, you're a little want, Buddha. I, she's a little Buddha. But like, I want, I want, and I, and I encourage people to give kids the words. Cause a lot of times when we're talking to other people, we kind of ignore patterns or we think kids aren't as enlightened and as bright as they are. And so we're sending them off into the world to learn how to like interact with other people just based on passive conversations. Mm -hmm. So instead, when I hear things, and she'll be like, well, that was your fault. And I'm like, okay, let's talk about telling someone that something's their fault. You're blaming them. And this is what it looks like. And so now she has the language to kind of be like, ooh, that was blame. We shouldn't blame people. I take you know, responsibility I just, for that. I just, like, if, if all parents did that, like, what kind of, like, world would we be creating, you know? I think, I like, I know down the line, like, once I have kids, like, hands down, my work will be around conscious parenting. Like yeah. I know that because I've had to go through the depths of my own childhood. I had very traumatic childhood and there's a purpose to it, right? There's a purpose to it. So that's again, getting out of the victim, choosing to be victorious and understanding that it's all happening for us. And that these are like the breadcrumbs that are showing you what's happening. So I love the work that you're doing. I think it's so critical. And I think it's, like I said, I'm so passionate about conscious families and like raising a real, a conscious generation. I like, that's, what's going to heal the world. Yeah. Like, and I, I, when you were talking about what I kept seeing was like, how amazing would it be for us? You know, if, if we have the opportunity to do it, to bring our kids to these developing countries and to really see what's happening with the kids there and have them interact with the kids there, you know, and to really see, mm -hmm. just to have a deeper sense of that depth. Like I know for me, once I have kids, like I'm going to, I'm going to bring my kids with me around the world. Like I want my kids to experience, I want them to be global citizens to really experience the different cultures because in America we can be in this bubble. Oh yes. Oh yes. Absolutely. It's, you know, and so for me, like I'm working on getting my vibration to the space where I can have the financial abundance to be able to bring my children to these developing countries, have them do humanitarian work while also respecting the culture. Um, so it's not like this, like, oh, I'm from the West and I'm here to save you. It's like, no, I want to learn from you. Yeah, no. And that's so important. And it's actually, it's funny as I was traveling through Africa, like I saw astounding poverty and children without shoes and bathing in muddy, you know, water. And yeah, all I could think is I, I want my daughter to see this when it's time, right? I, I need her to see what's happening in the world because we are a very inwardly obsessed country. Um, and I think I love what you just said though, about also respecting the culture, because that's one of the things that I realized so resolutely while I was there is that we don't have all the answers and you know Im immersive experiences and understanding um I, I i think that's the only way that we're going to be able to bridge gaps it's the experience because it's it's it, it it touches the heart and then through that that touching of that heart of you know we are human like Mm -hmm. And we are becoming a heart centered consciousness. Like that's what's happening. Like the old chakra system is kind of like transforming into just being centered in the heart, especially once you've done like 
the deep inner child, uh, like from zero to 22, like that deep trauma work and that healing work, there isn't, there aren't any blocks there anymore in those, in those chakras. So then you're all in centered to the heart. So I, I feel like, uh, like I'm so optimistic about our future and I feel like we've only scratched the surface of what is possible. Yeah. No, I agree. I'm, I'm very, like I said, I can't wait to see what the next five or so years yeah. look like. I think there's going to be some, some big shifts that we don't even expect. Um, I, I know a lot of people, and I know that this is a controversial topic, but I know when, when Trump came into office, a lot of people were very um, like, I can't believe this is happening. It and had I said, to. It, it had to. If there's anything that's come from him is that people have catalyzed mm-hmm. um, and they're they're more open to a different way of, of being relating and leading and, and active and more women and people of color, not even women, people of color are stepping forward and saying, I need to now be a voice for my community. Share your and medicine. So yes. I'm like, all right, you did your thing. You had, he had some kind of contract. Too. Yeah. I, I definitely agree with you. Like I'm so passionate about, like I said, I'm passionate about politics and like doing understanding and really tapping into it, that has been his purpose, you know, is just to really clean up, transmute, and to, there's been a lot of debris in this country too, you know, Mm -hmm. from, I, to me, it's like Nixon repeating itself, watching Mm -hmm. this whole administration. So to me, it's like, okay, there were still wounds of America that really needed to be addressed. And this is like, the scabs have been lifted off, and it's (laughs) like, okay, let's like put the salve on by like embracing love and by really like hearing the people whose voices, you know, like the ignorance and trying to, and educating them through love and understanding that everyone's doing their best based on how aware they are. So I definitely, I'm very excited to see like more people, like the work is not over, you know, like people, if anything, more and more people are understanding like, oh shit, I have like responsibility. I have to clean up my mess right now. Like, it's not like, okay, we've plateaued with that. No, like people are like reading your book. They're like, re- like listening to this podcast. Like they're searching to really elevate their, their, their awareness and their consciousness and to heal and to like be that disruptor. So to end this uh, call, this has been so fun. I've been thoroughly enjoying this. Thank you for Yay, being here me too. holding this and going, I hate small talk. So I love going deep in this. This is so great. So there are a few questions that I love to uh, round up with. Sure. What would you say is your animal totem? Your spirit? The, li- the, the lioness. lioness. Woo! Well, so when I was just in Africa, I experienced the lioness in all ways, all manner of ways as the partner to a lion and the way she respected him, but at the same time, let him know that she had a voice how she acted as a mother and the way she nurtured her cubs, but also how a, the pride of lioness came together and raised their cubs together and fed together. And they would go and kill an animal and then they would eat. And there was such respect from the animal kingdom that the hyenas and the jackals and the vultures would not come in until the lioness was done and signaled them that she was done. And that was now their time. So I got to see her in all of this And I was just like, that's my spirit animal. (laughs) Like amazing. Because I feel like we are so we're so layered. And here I can speak from a data finance, high finance perspective, and I can put on the business suits and I can be a really loving, nurturing mom and uh, and a a woman. Yeah, like and I can be a woman for women and I can be a good partner. And so I'm like, that's that's my spirit animal. I love that. Okay, this is you're gonna love this conversation. Okay. This question. What would you say to younger Jeanette? So in the book, I said, You are so powerful. And I think I think that stands true today, even Lioness, hello. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, because we doubt ourselves, even when we realize like how far we've come. I think that's the one thing. Younger Jeanette grew up in poverty, grew up not like the poverty I saw in Africa. After that, I was like, you know, completely different. Um, But the women around me in my neighborhood were abused. They were trafficked. They were beaten. They were murdered. And so I saw really terrible things as a kid. and, And women were subjugated to a very 
ugly, brutal reality. And so I always knew that I was supposed to be somebody and I knew I, I wasn't supposed to be there, but I didn't know what that meant. And so my advice to my younger self was like, you are so powerful. You just don't know it yet. Now I know that I'm powerful. Aww. I just have to remind myself of it every now and then when I'm like, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> I love that. Okay. So other than lore, what would you say was the book that really changed the trajectory of your life? Oh, wow. So I have to say The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron because I still use her writing practices. I, I got, it was a gift from someone that I dated in my twenties and I still use it as a practice to unlock myself. And I mention it um, a lot because I feel like unblocking yourself and learning what's in there under the hum, right? It's the greatest gift that you can give to yourself. Really learning yourself and knowing yourself um, without the noise of who people tell you that you are comes out of, out of writing and journaling. And it has been um, a, a game changer for me. It's a, it's a common book that people share on here. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. So, uh, what would something like, what would you say to someone who, you know, may have a hard time with their daughter right now? People that are having a hard time, like connecting with their daughter, with their children, Mm -hmm. what would you say? Um, I would say to have faith and to dig in to your truth as a parent. I know that there's going to become times where things are difficult between me and my daughter. I, I mean, I know that she's going to be a teenager. I know that there's going to be times where she doesn't think I'm very bright. Um, I was raised with an alcoholic addict mother. And I don't know what it's like to have a connection with a, a maternal figure, right? And the one thing that I know as a mom now of a daughter is that I did my very best. I opened communication. I always used, I always trusted. And she asked me one time, she goes, mommy, how are you such a good mom? She's never met her grandmother. And she knows that my, my mom has grown up problems. And she's like, how are you such a good mom? And I said, because I always think of what I would have wanted when I was your age. Mm-hmm. So the advice I would give is look at your child that you're having trouble with and say, what would I have wanted from my parent when I was 13, 15, 16, 18? Mm-hmm. And trust that aspect and know that sometimes they have to go away to come back. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that so much. That's so beautiful. Oh, okay. So where can we find you? Um, I spend a lot of time on Instagram. (laughs) So um, at ms.janetteschneider. My website is janetteschneider.com. I just launched my own podcast, which has been so much fun. Yay, congrats. Thank you. It's called Gold with Jeanette Schneider on Apple and Spotify. Um, So I'm always around. Amazing. And then one last question. If there's something that's like coming up for you that just feels like someone is like needs to hear right here, right now, what would you want to share? I think the biggest piece of advice I could give anyone is to invest in themselves. And that's, that's primal, whatever that means to you, whether that's spending money on a therapist or a healer, or that means you need a life coach. If you're searching in any way, shape or form, wake up in the morning looking for inspiration, invest in yourself. It's, it's the best money, time, energy you will ever spend. Amen. I agree with that. And I think a lot of people don't understand that like even people like spiritual teachers or coaches, like we still have coaches too. Oh yes. Like, yeah. Oh yes. I, yeah. I still I have like mentors and a coach still because it's like that's how I'm going to continue to up level and to be of service. So I love that message. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this incredible conversation. I'm so inspired and so grateful to have you here. Go check out Lore and go do the work, guys. Just do the work for the <laughs> generations. Damn it. No. <laughs> no, I agree. Do it. I love yeah, that. You'll, appreciate, you. you'll, you'll thank us later. So exactly. thank you everyone for tuning in. And thank you again, Jeanette, for being here. And we'll be chatting with you all soon. Take care.